cool. Um, excellent. So again, thanks for having me, uh, or at least having me remotely. Uh, apologies, I couldn't be there in person. Um, so today, I want to tell you a bit about this kind of ongoing research agenda that is happening in my lab here at Brown, um, and we'll focus kind of concretely on one particular recent project that's sort of our first stab in this direction. Um, but first, I just want to briefly uh, get started with um, just a little bit about who I am, since I don't think everybody in the room has met me before. So I am uh, relatively recent at Brown. I just started, uh, gosh, going on three years ago now, in fall of 2017. Um, as was just mentioned, I did my undergrad at Berkeley, hopped across the bay to do my graduate work at Stanford um, before coming to Brown. Um, I'm actually a California native originally, so I did grow up kind of in Northern California uh, in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, it's very beautiful up there. Not a, not a whole lot happening though, so I, uh, I, uh, I'm grateful to have gotten to spend time in cool cities like um, San Francisco and, and now in Providence. Um, I'm also a big uh, science fiction uh, reader, so I founded a book club at Brown, and I know I'm gonna be meeting with some of you one-on-one -on -one later today, so if you wanna swap book recommendations, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, and uh, just another random tidbit is I, I used to be a ballroom dancer once upon a time back in my grad school career. Okay, so, so broadly speaking, as was mentioned, um, my research sits at the intersection of graphics and artificial intelligence and machine learning. That's where I like to hang out. And more specifically, I'm interested in taking, examining different kinds of generative models. So either kind of symbolic programs, deep neural networks, various combinations of the two, and using them to synthesize what I like to think of as 3D structures. So shapes, objects, scenes, different, different levels of detail. Um, but also kind of closing a loop and looking at the inference problem of how do we infer, given a particular 3D structure, what is the underlying generative process that gave rise to it? Uh, and so today, I want to answer this question that's sort of implicit in the title of the talk, which is what are, what do I mean by neurosymbolic 3D models and how do they relate to all of this? Uh, and I should say, I do have, I do have a view, a little tiny thumbnail view of the room uh, here while I'm giving the talk. So if anybody uh, has a question, wants to interrupt, just shoot your hand up, wave it a bit so I can see you and, uh, and I'd be happy to, to take questions. All right, so just a little bit of, of background and motivation before I really dig into the, the the details here. So the main motivation for this direction uh, of research is the kind of increasing demand for, for 3D content out there in the world. Um, in graphics, we have our traditional drivers of demand for 3D content, things like um, various entertainment applications, games, virtual reality experiences. Um, you know, these industries aren't getting smaller, uh, and so there's a, there's a demand to be able to create 3D content at scale for them. But Actually, potentially more interesting um, is this new kind of new driver of demand for 3D content, which is uh, artificial intelligence itself. So thinking of kind of graphics for AI. If I want to, for example, train a vision system, uh, you know, it's hard to get labels for things like semantic segmentation from a person. But if I have a 3D scene that I can render somewhat photorealistically, uh, I kind of have those labels for free uh, in the structure of the underlying 3D model so I can get those segments uh, almost, almost automatically. Um, we're starting to see this in uh, whoops, autonomous navigation. Let me turn this off. So this is probably some of you have seen Facebook's Habitat virtual environments. This is a simulator for doing kind of first person embodied uh, simulated agents inside of virtual environments. Um, these ha obviously have to come from somewhere. So the ones that we're seeing in this video are 3D reconstructions of real world spaces, but also equally exciting are, are people doing work in uh, synthetic virtual spaces as well. So there's a uh, demand to try to generate those. Um, and then we've also got, this is actually uh, something in robotics. This is a video from um, some colleagues of mine here at Brown where they have this Has mobile, this mobile robot that's trying to understand awesome. something about um, this microwave. It's trying to figure out, okay, where does this door in the microwave hinge when I look at it? So here's kind of its raw point cloud observation of the world. Um, and the way that they, they train this, this robot to figure this out is via a bunch of uh, simulated examples of these like very simplified kind of doors and drawers that are opening. Um, and by kind of simulating, uh, seeing a bunch of these things via a simulated depth sensor, it learns how to, uh, to open kind of real world objects it's never seen before. So that's cool. Um, the big problem though is that the current practices in 3D modeling really can't quite meet the demands 
of today's and tomorrow's applications. So, you know, basically, it's kind of amazing that this is still the case, uh, you know, so many decades uh, into the, the existence of computer graphics as a field, but the 3D modeling is pretty much done through manual, uh, pretty tedious processes. So it's still very slow and it's still very hard to learn. If any of you have suffered through trying to operate the Maya or Blender interface, uh, or if you've tried to work with, say, SolidWorks to create um, uh, more sort of manufacturable solid objects, you can commiserate with the sentiment that there's these interfaces are hideously complex, very idiosyncratic. There's a lot of a lot of details to figure out. Um, so you know maybe generative models can come to our rescue here. Um, basically, for the purposes of this talk, I will be defining generative model a generative model as some procedure which can be executed to create novel instances of some 3D object class. Now I know that that's not the kind of formal definition of generative model that's typically given in uh, probabilistic modeling, but that this is the one that I'll use uh, for this talk. So there's a lot of benefits to having a generative, such, such a generative model if we were to have it. So we could, for example, generate lots of 3D content at scale. So this is a screenshot of uh, the speed tree procedural tree engine running inside of Unreal. So you can kind of generate massive scale forests uh, with very little human effort. Um, and then there are things like Esri City Engine, which is a procedural modeling system for uh, urban planning and urban design, uh, which you, know, you can get these fairly realistic looking cities uh, relatively quickly. Another, another benefit, even if you're not you know, some giant game studio that needs to make huge expansive worlds, you just wanna make one 3D model, generative models can provide you with the ability to explore different possibilities in the sort of class of models you're interested in. So here is a fairly recent generative model of uh, 3D objects where we're kind of navigating in the latent space of this generative model to look at different possible cars that it could output, see how things are related, see how things are similar to other things that we might have seen before. Um, and finally, and probably I guess of most interest to the folks in this room, is that uh, they can provide a very strong prior for vision systems, especially when you have noisy or incomplete sensor input. Uh, this is an example of taking partial 3D scans, so 3D reconstructions that are incomplete because of occlusions or because of uh, kind of an incomplete scan pattern, or perhaps some parts of these objects are made of highly specular materials that, uh, that don't sort of show up well under the current um, sensing modality. What we're doing here is we're taking the raw scans, we're kind of projecting them into a latent space of a generative model of these sort of cuboid proxy 3D chairs, and then we decode in that latent space, you know, what is the chair that looks most similar to what we saw as input. And this has some really nice regularizing effects, some nice kind of shape completion effects. So these are powerful for, uh, you know, hopefully one day allowing autonomous agents to um, get pretty high level information out of pretty incomplete sensor info. So I like to think about generative models, these sort of three generative models as falling into two broad categories. The first are procedural models. So these uh, basically have the following kind of advantages. One is that uh, they give you high quality output by construction. So these are a few output houses from a, a shape grammar for architecture called CGA++. This was a few years ago at SIGGRAPH. Um, and basically the, the, the output space of the grammar, it can't generate anything bad. Like it's only allowed to construct geometry by a kind of subdividing, uh, subdividing space, creating you know, planar primitives and extruding them. Uh, it has kind of uh, special operators for creating these roof geometries. So, you know, no matter how you explore the kind of design space of these grammars, they can't produce anything bad. They, they can only produce nice looking geometry. Um, you could also argue that they're quite interpretable and editable. So this is uh, kind of a, a snippet of code from one of these CGA++ grammars, where, you know, it has some way you define a variable called parcel, which sort of splits this uh, initial uh, bounding rectangle kind of randomly along the X dimension. Um, then we can do things where we can identify uh, each one of those things splits into something called footprint. For every footprint, we execute some event handler, which does some extrusion to create these procedural buildings. Um, there's all sorts of complicated things you can do. Like you can say, okay, well, if it's the tallest building, then make those offices, otherwise make them apartments. And I can have subroutines for defining what offices and apartments are. Uh, it's very easy if I, you know, if I take this generative model, it's easy, uh, at least if I, you know, know something about the structure of code to make tweaks to it and get uh, different output results. However, this, uh, this does come with some downsides. One is that 
while it is interpretable and possible to edit, one could argue that it is, it is rather difficult to author or edit. You do need to have quite a bit of programming expertise to at least understand what this is telling you. Um, and you, know, you could argue that, that creating a procedural model of, of a group of buildings like this is at least as hard uh, as creating one of them. You know? So in some sense, you're, you're, uh, you're paying uh, quite a significant uh, initial investment to get this flexible generative model. Um, the other thing is that there's, they're kind of, by their nature, they have a limited possible class of shapes they can capture. So this data is- data consists of six oops, object classes. Each yes, so basically this is the, the set of procedural, procedurally generated, um, you know, microwaves and, and drawers and things from this robotics project I was telling you about, where a grad student just sat down and manually, you know, by hand, created sort of six different simple procedural models for cabinets, drawers, microwaves, refrigerators. Uh, they each have some number of parameters to vary things like heights and widths and depths and stuff like that. Um, but that's basically it. You know, if you wanted to have a new type of, uh, I don't know, maybe you wanted to have an oven that opens some other way, or maybe there is some interesting geometric feature that's not present in any of these um, particular models. If your robot sees it in the real world, it's, you're kind of screwed because you, you just, you're, you've never seen this at training time. So, um, you know, basically the output variety is limited to whatever the person put in the program. And in principle, you can add lots more variety by just enriching the program, but then these programs start to become uh, fairly cumbersome, have tons of switch statements in them, and get difficult to reason about. So on the flip side, we've got uh, deep generative models, so neural networks that generate these shapes. Um, and these kind of have a different set of, of pros and cons. So their, their biggest advantage is their variety, right? You know, we know sort of in theory, neural networks can approximate any function. So in theory, uh, an appropriately designed deep generative model of 3D shapes could learn to generate any class of shapes. And so here's, you know, from that same recent paper I was showing, an example of the same, exact same architecture, right, being used to generate chairs, planes, cars, right? You couldn't do this with the procedural model, right? You need a very differently structured procedural model to generate each one of these types of shapes. Um, and the other kind of corollary here is that these are easy to author, right? It's assuming you've got the architecture, authoring a new model just means, you know, just add data, just add more examples to the base architecture and you get a new generative model. But of course, there's no free lunch. So the cons here is uh, you get very inconsistent output quality. This is kind of one of your classic failure cases of interpolating the latent space of a deep generative shape model. And there's lots of garbage that kind of happens, not only in between and sort of the intermediate interpolation states, but even at the endpoints, there are things, geometry gets blobby. There are sort of floating disconnected patches, things that just would not happen in the real world and things that a well-designed procedural model just would never allow by construction. Uh, and finally, there's nothing really interpretable about these. Their, their representation is pretty inscrutable, right? You've got some latent code that's this big jumbled collection of numbers. Who knows what each of those numbers represents? You can, you can fiddle with it. You, know, you can do latent space interpolation or arithmetic, but uh, you kind of have to discover what those axes mean by trial and error. So you know, if we look at these two different methods, these two broad classes of generative model, and we look at their various pros and cons, it would be nice to be able to say, you know, can we somehow design some system that gets us all of these benefits uh, and none of these disadvantages? And so that's the, that's the quest that I'm sort of on these days. Um, and the way I like to think about approaching this problem is to say, well, generative models, one of the things they do is they, they capture variation in a class of shapes. And we can think about variations, uh, shape variations being decomposable into different modes. So some of the modes of variability within a shape class, I think can easily be expressed symbolically, like in the kinds of representations that programs uh, give us. So one of those is hierarchy. So for example, if I have a, a lamp, so this lamp right here, I can decompose this into a body, a base, and kind of the head unit. The head unit then further decomposes into this kind of articulated arm, uh, and uh, this also decomposes into the head, the head decomposes into a cover and a light bulb, and so on and so forth. These, these relationships are easy to express symbolically. In fact, I've done it here, right? This is expressed as a graph or a tree, if you will. Um, so I can easily express this with sort of discrete links, and each link maybe has a label. So that's nice. 
Um, other forms of relations like connectivity, like the fact that this leg is attached to this space and even potentially what part, what point on the space it's attached to, that's also something I could express with a sort of symbolic operator. Um, and other kind of higher order relations, things like symmetry. So for example, this is a, a translational symmetry group of, of sort of horizontal slats, a rotational symmetry group of the legs of the swivel chair, or a reflectional symmetry group on these two kind of arm pieces. Um, again, those are, those are fairly symbolic. I could write down, uh, this is a translational group. It has one, two, three, four, eight uh, repetitions. The you know, base geometry looks like this and the translational offset is some vector. And I can write all that down fairly interpretably. Um, and you could imagine coming up with you know, other kinds of, of variations like this. However, there are other modes of variation that are, that are difficult or more difficult to express symbolically. It's harder to think about how you do that. So one of them is, is sort of fine scale geometry. That in some cases, you know, I can look at the kind of fine detail geometry of these, say these two shapes, and I can say, well, you know, if I look at, say, the geometry of this, uh, this side mirror, I, I can't really think of, uh, of, a, of a set of symbols that expresses that, uh, or perhaps the, you know, the, the exact way that this, that this arm of this chair curves. Um, you know, it, potentially these can be expressed through some very, very complicated uh, uh, set of, you know, low-level operators that maybe like a CNC machine would, would use or some kind of manufacturing machine. But, from a human kind of reasoning standpoint, I think it's, it's, it's difficult to think about symbols that represent these particular geometries. Um, and the other thing are these really complex inter-part correlations. So um, if I have, you know, this is here I'm navigating in the latent space of airplanes. And, you know, as I, as I change the shape of the wings, their position on the body also shifts. As I change the shape of the wings, the existence and positions of engines changes. Uh, and you could imagine trying to write down a bunch of kind of if then rules for these kinds of correlations, but it starts to get hairy pretty quickly. Um, and so for many of these modes of variability, uh, kind of capturing them via an entangled latent space seems like maybe it's, uh, it's more appropriate than, than trying to explicitly enumerate all of them. And, you know, the list could go on. So, you know, I, we look at these two different classes and, uh, the, the, the design philosophy that I'm taking in, in trying to kind of come up with this, uh, you know, one generative model to rule them all, so to speak, is to say that really what we should do is we should use symbols where it's possible, like where it's, it's easy to express things, and then kind of use neural nets for everything else, kind of let them be the catch-all to capture variability that we can't express with symbols. Um, but we want to design, you know, a, a representation that lets us do both of these things. So that's what I'm calling a neurosymbolic 3D model. So it's a generative model of probably some class of 3D object, which models some modes of variability via explicit program symbols and others via some inscrutable deep latent space. And there's quite a lot of, uh, there's quite a broad design space of possible representations that, that kind of conforms to this specification. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm really only going to explore one kind of small subspace of this design space that we've looked at thus far in a recent project, um, which is something that we call models of shape structure. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on that. And then uh, at the very, very end, I'll come back and kind of highlight some of the, the directions for further exploration in this space that would be interesting to look at in the near future. Okay, so neurosymbolic models of shape structure. What do I, what do I mean by shape structure? Um, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm defining it as basically the parts uh, out of which a shape is composed and the relations that, uh, you know, that connect those, those parts. So relations could be things like hierarchy, connectivity, symmetry, many of the relations that I discussed before. So here I'm showing kind of a, a hierarchical decomposition of a chair, which decomposes into three subparts, base, seat, and back. <clears throat> um, Base further decomposes into uh, you know, different sub, sub assemblies that make up the legs. And then these orange lateral edges uh, between these things are expressing other kinds of uh, lateral relations, things like connectivity or symmetry. Um, so I'm, I, here I'm just representing the parts as kind of cuboids, right? Oriented bounding volumes, um, which definitely it sacrifices some geometric detail, 
but I think you, you could argue that this is still a useful representation, even though we don't have that geometric detail. You can imagine uh, trying to use this to do robot motion planning. If the robot can infer all the parts and relations of an object, given say a raw point cloud, um, that may be enough for it to decide, you know, what can I do, do with this object? Where should I grasp, uh, for example? Um, and, and I think one of the things I'll come back to later is that uh, I think we can also extend this neurosymbolic modeling idea to the, the, the lower level geometry that, that's kind of being elided by this representation. The other thing you'll note is that I'm really focusing on manufactured objects here. So these are things that are created by people for, for human use, things like chairs, tables, cars, airplanes, and the like. Um, I think that's a reasonable focus because those are most of the objects that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis that we would like our robots to be able to interact with as well. Um, but I should say that, that I don't think that this, that this representation or this direction of research is limited to just manufactured objects. You could extend this to more organic objects via other kinds of, kind of um, primitive decompositions. There's one that I particularly like called generalized cylinder decomposition, which will try to find these kinds of um, sort of cylindrical, cylinder-like primitive shapes uh, in kind of arbitrary 3D meshes. Um, so you could imagine imposing uh, relations on these to uh, model organic shapes as well. Okay, so, you know, that given that this is our goal, we'd like to have a generative model of these kinds of shape structures. I think in some sense, like the holy grail of, of generative uh, structure modeling would be to have like a single interpretable, interpretable procedural model that generates the structures of every object we can imagine in a given class, like say all chairs in the world or all airplanes. Um, that'd be great, but we know from the slide I showed previously that procedural models kind of can't exactly do this. They have these, these, these disadvantages that um, their, their, their output variety is limited, so it's not going to be very possible to create one procedural model that captures all chairs, uh, and it is kind of annoying to author them. So, so can we kind of strategically apply neural nets in just the right places to try to eliminate some of these, these concerns? And my, uh, our first step at this in my group was to do the following, say, okay, if one of the problems is that procedural models are hard to author, then let's not have people write them. Okay, let's, let's train a neural net to write them for us. So if our goal is to say, um, generate me all the possible chairs in the world, then I will have a neural network that will write, uh, that will learn to write procedural models. Each procedural model will capture some uh, subset of chairs and the sort of the union of all possible procedural models this neural network can generate will then capture all of the chairs in the world that I might be interested in. Um, this then leads to, uh, actually just directly leads to a solution to the second problem, which is, okay, if, if the output variety of a single procedural model is limited, then the latent space of this neural net is gonna capture the variability that each symbolic program does not. So in some sense, um, we, we're saying the shape space has some uh, intrinsic variability that's there, and some of it is going to be uh, sort of captured by the, sim the symbols of the program and the rest of it will sort of let live in the, uh, in the neural net's latent space. Okay. So here is a, a kind of a high level pipeline of, of what I just described. So what we do is we start with uh, input, input shapes and the shapes are represented via these hierarchical part graphs. So we know what all the parts are, so that the shapes have all been segmented into parts. We know how those parts are connected, and we have some hierarchical organization of them. So that is that is the assumption we make on the input. It's a non-trivial assumption, but there are uh, data sets that exist that look like this. Um, so PartNet from Stanford is one of them. Um, next, what we have to do is we have to divide, we define some sort of domain-specific language, a DSL for modeling such shapes. How do we how do we you know generate such shapes? I, ideally, this should be something that is parametric so that we can vary the parameters and get different shapes output. It should have the nice property that we want from procedural models that the outputs are always sort of valid by construction in some sense. And we'll talk about what I mean uh, in this particular uh, instance. Given these two things, we can, we can first extract programs from shapes. So just using kind of raw geometric analysis, we can figure out for a given shape that's in our data set, what program best represents it. And then we use this data set of programs to train some generative model that, uh, that learns to write programs. So it has latent space C and then each latent code kind of decodes into this, uh, this sort of hierarchy of programs where 
Uh, each program is a subroutine that may call other subroutines. So for example, I may have a, a subroutine that generates a leg and I, you know, I call it four times to generate all of these different uh, legs of this chair. So that's the high level pipeline that we're gonna be digging into here. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of describe first of all the language that we designed for this. This is something that took a few iterations of trial and error. We're still working on it. We're not completely happy with it, but uh, I think it's, it's good enough to at least share with the world in some capacity at this point. So we call this language shape assembly um, because it is in some sense an assembly language for part-based shapes. And I mean assembly language in at least two senses. In one sense, uh, it's a language that is comprised of low-level instructions, like a machine assembly language would be, something like, you know, your x86 or ARM. Uh, but it's also an assembly language in that the way in which it, it, it generates shapes is by assembling parts. So it, it declares parts and it connects them together into a connected assembly. Um, so here is kind of, uh, here's the, the, the grammar of the DSL and a couple of concrete instances of what a shape assembly program would look like. So basically every program uh, consists of three blocks. There's this B block where we, we sort of declare a bunch of the boxes that uh, a shape is made of. Um, uh, sorry, the B block, this, this declares the, um, the, the overall bounding box of the shape. The C block defines all the cuboids out of which the shape is made. And then the A block defines uh, all of the attachments that exist between these, uh, between these cubes. And you'll notice that it's actually possible for uh, a cuboid to attach to the bounding box. So for example, we can say that, you know, this thing is attached to the top of the bounding box. And that would mean that if I were to say, uh, have this program exist in some kind of editor and I grabbed the top of the box and moved it, the whole thing would sort of stretch out accordingly and it would stay connected. Um, the way attachments are specified is that uh, we, we say, okay, well, you attach essentially two cuboids together. So um, you attach cube zero to say the bounding box. Each attachment has to specify the face of the cuboid in which that attachment occurs, and on that face, what point. And these points are expressed in relative coordinates, these things that in graphics we call UV coordinates. So 0 0.5, 0 0.5 would be the center of a, of a face, 0, 0 would be a corner, 1, 1 would be the other corner, etc. cetera. So uh, these parameters kind of uniquely specify an attachment between two cuboids. Um, the nice thing about this representation is that uh, it guarantees that these programs, uh, that the outputs of these programs are connected by construction. So one of the very common failure modes that you get from a deep generative model, which is that uh, they generate this kind of garbage floating geometry, uh, is actually impossible in this representation. It cannot generate floating parts. They have to be connected. Um, so that's pretty cool. That was one of the main things that we sought to address uh, with this, this representation. Okay. I've been talking for a while. Are there any questions at this point? I want to make sure I'm not steamrolling over people if they have any, any thoughts they want, to, they want to get off the chest. No? I don't see any, any hands frankly waving in the air, so I will go ahead and continue. All right. So the other thing I should say about this is this, uh, this figure here is, is showing basically one level of the shape assembly program. But as I mentioned before, our input data, right, our hierarchical part graphs, so we actually have hierarchies of these connected assemblies of parts. And that means that our programs, let me get back, our programs themselves are also hierarchical. So th there's a lot of lines of text here. I don't expect you to try to read all of them, but what I'm showing you here is this assembly called program zero is the thing that assembles the, uh, the root level shape. So it has an overall bounding box. It has uh, a cuboid that expresses um, the seat. It has a cuboid that expresses um, the, the, the legs. And this, this thing called program two that I've declared here. So here I just, I just declare what its bounding volume is. But then um, I can actually go ahead and, and invoke program two. And that itself generates a subassembly of connected boxes. And so what would happen is in the full execution of this program, um, this subassembly would get swapped in for this, this sort of proxy box. And we'd end up with, I don't have the visualization here, unfortunately. But you can imagine basically taking this and sort of plugging it in right there um, to get a more detailed shape. And, and so basically what, what happens is that this cuboid right here, this sort of declaration, serves as the top level bounding box for this program. And that's kind of the way that we enforce uh, uh, modularity. That's sort of the abstraction boundary. That this program doesn't know anything about what's going on in its parent program, except uh, it just has this, this bounding box connection. Okay, 
So the next question to answer is, how do you actually execute one of these programs? So you know, this sort of declares all of the, all of the parts and how they're connected. How do we actually uh, turn those declarations into geometry? And there's a bunch of ways you, you could have thought to do this. Um, the way that we ended up doing it was actually through this imperative semantics. So uh, if I imagine that first I've executed this part of the program, it just uh, sort of declares all of these cuboids kind of sitting at the origin, all axis aligned. Uh, but all but with all the sizes that I declared them to have. And then as I execute each of these attached statements, um, the boxes uh, have to move and, and scale and rotate in order to satisfy these constraints. So if I say attach you know, cube to the bottom, boom, it's done. If I say attach cube to the top, it has to translate this red cube up to the top to satisfy this attachment. And in the sequence that those attachments are declared, I go ahead and I execute all of those, those operators. So you know, here I attach this arm over here, and then I attach this arm over here. Um, I, I'm not going to go into the details of this. Uh, we, we do have sort of a, a well-defined semantics of how attach works. So, you know, it preferentially tries to move the object to create an attachment. Uh, but if it needs to, it will rotate and scale it. Um, and there's sort of some things we try to do if there are, um, if, if an object, if a program declares more attachments than are actually all simultaneously satisfiable, we try to sort of resolve them in kind of a least square sense. Um, the details aren't super important. The, the detail that is important is the reason we chose this, um, this imperative semantics as opposed to say one where you just treat all these as constraints and then execute some sort of constraint solver under the hood um, is that this is differentiable. So all of the, all the execution that takes the parameters of this program to geometry is something you can back propagate through, which was important for us um, as we'll see, it's not super important for training a generative model to, to generate these things, but it's, it's important for some of the things you might do with that generative model afterwards. Um, okay, so that's what, our, that's what our language looks like for now. That's the current, the current state of the language. Um, I will say, I'm not gonna say too much about it, but I will say a little bit about how we extract uh, programs from the raw shapes in our data set. Um, so there's a bunch of obvious stuff that we do here. So you know we kind of detect where parts touch using collision detection. We extract kind of their face-to-face -face attachment points. All that stuff is fairly obvious. Um, the interesting bits are actually um, one of the things that we kind of realize is, is due to the fact that we have this imperative execution semantics as we execute every line of the program as it's declared. Um, the order in which you declare attachments actually matters. So if I have uh, if I have for example this shape. And it's uh, you know it's currently in this state, and then I decide okay, now I want to um, kind of attach this this top this top bar to um, get everything connected. If I if I execute these connections, so here you'll see these connections. I'm sending attach part one to part three, attach part two to part three. Um, I'm executing the same set of connections just in different orders, and I end up getting different output shapes as a result. Um, just so you know, this one on the left, I believe, is this or the correct one that was actually um, what the original shape looked like. And so, you know, what we do here, it's not terribly complicated. We, we have some heuristics that allow us to prune out a bunch of possible orders that couldn't possibly reproduce the input shape. Um, and then essentially what we do is we use our, our differentiable executor to say, okay, under each of these different attach operators, uh, optimize the parameters of the program to try to fit the geometry of the original shape. And whichever one fits the best is the one that we declare as the correct order. Um, so that's kind of the, the approach there. All right, that's all I will say about extracting programs from shapes. Obviously, you can tell probably, you know, oh, there's a question back, yeah. So um, when, when you do this, um, this order, are you assuming that all your individual pieces are already scaled in the right way to sort of be the best fit? Or? No, so we don't actually assume that the scales are correct. Um, as I mentioned, uh, let's see, back here, so, um, will actually, uh, the attach operator can actually, uh, it, it's free to, to rescale a part as necessary to satisfy an attachment. Um, so, so in some sense, the, the, final, the final scale and orientation of, of the parts is implicitly defined by the attachments that they're, that they're involved in. Okay, so, so what is the best fit then? So what is the best fit? The best fit is essentially what we do is, um, so for example, if this is what the original geometry of the shape looked like, um, and we, we hypothesize that, okay, maybe this, uh, maybe this sequence of attach operators is the correct one. We would then uh, use like a standard surface to surface matching, you know, like a chamfer distance, for example, 
to realize that, oh, actually, this geometry doesn't match this one very well. And so this is not the correct order. This one is better. OK. I have a question, too. Yeah, go ahead. So in this case, the fact that it's differentiable is also important, right? Because you're doing a search over different possible programs. Like there, there's no uh, so yeah, so the, the, it's, it's, it's important in the sense that we are searching over the discrete structure in the sense that we're searching over the, the possible permutations of the attached statements. But the differentiable um, executor is important because once we fix a particular ordering, there are still continuous parameters in that program that need to be defined, like, like where the attachments occur and things like that. And so we want to optimize those to fit the original geometry as best as possible. So it's kind of a, it's a continuous optimization inside of a combinatorial search. Other questions? Okay, seems like we're good. Uh, all right, so I will continue. Um, all right, so then we get to sort of some of the meat of this, which is in learning to generate these programs, or I like to say we're learning to write these programs. So uh, I'm just going to throw up. <laughs> I didn't have a ton of time to like really break this down for you. So I'm just going to throw up the, uh, the the architecture diagram from our paper, and, and I can I can dig through it in some details, but. The idea is that um, this is, uh, you know, if you kind of look at this, this middle part here, this is a variational autoencoder. Uh, it's a hierarchical variational autoencoder. So the way that it would work, if I wanted to sample something from it, um, you know, I've got some encoder. The encoder produces, right, uh, a mean and a standard deviation in my latent space. And then from that, I can sample a root latent code Z. And then there's a process by which I hierarchically decode, right, this sort of, this tree of subprograms. Um, and uh, what I've done here in this box is I've kind of expanded what goes on inside of one, one level, the decoder that exists at one of these nodes. Um, before I get to that, I will say that what we use for the encoder, um, we actually just use some prior works. This is the encoder of StructureNet. StructureNet was a piece of recent prior work that learns to generate these hierarchical part graphs, although they're not represented as programs. They don't have these explicit connections. Um, so we, we just borrowed their encoder to encode things into our latent space. And then what we did is we designed uh, a decoder completely from scratch. Um, and so what this is, uh, it's actually, despite the visual complexity of this diagram, it's not a terribly complicated idea. It's basically uh, at each level of the hierarchy, right? We've got programs, which are a sequence of, of commands. And so we just have a, a sequential language model that tries to decode uh, each command. Um, so there's something about you know, which command uh, should be executed. If that command is an attached statement, we need to know something about which, which cuboids it connects and which faces they connect on. So these are all the discrete quantities that that command might invoke. And then we have this uh, separate branch that predicts the continuous parameters. So um, there's some cuboid dimensions and some face attachment points. Um, and then from those, once we have all those things, we, we can just sort of realize that as an actual line of the program. Um, and if we have some way of, of embedding these results back into um, a representation that we can feed into the next iteration and just proceed. The one complication here that's not sort of your standard, you know, bog standard uh, language model is that we also have uh, a branch off of this kind of core recurrent line that checks whether, uh, if, if this is a cuboid declaration, it checks whether that is leaf geometry or whether that should invoke a subroutine. And if it says yes, then we have a process that produces a child latent code, and this goes off and invokes another another one of these green boxes as some sub node. So that's how the, that's how the hierarchical part comes into play. Okay. Cool. That actually went a lot smoother than I was expecting it to. <laughs> so thanks for bearing with me on that. Um, all right. So that's that's basically the the implementation. So what can you do with this thing? Well. You know, the first obvious thing we can do is we can we can generate we can use the neural network to generate subprograms and then we execute, sorry, generate programs and then we execute those programs to create geometry. So here in the blue, what I'm showing are um, some the outputs of some programs that were sampled from this latent space, uh, and then you know we're doing the standard trick here of in green visualizing the nearest neighbor in the training set, just so that we can convince you that it's not completely memorizing uh, the data that it saw at training time. Um, and I think it's kind of cool the fact that there are the fact that it um, the, the the representation uh, defines shapes via this this sort of attachment based representation leads to some interesting inductive biases like I really love this chair that kind of has like this shelf below it like that doesn't show up anywhere in the in the data set but it's like a that's a plausible thing that you might want you might want to have it's kind of fun um, 
you know, it, it wouldn't be a generative modeling paper if I didn't show you something about interpolations. Um, so, you know, there's some interesting things where in order to get from this kind of sort of straight backed chair uh, to more of an armchair like shape, it kind of interpolates through this point where I have this pedestal base. Um, this bottom one is my favorite example because we start with a, uh, a, a chair, that, a slatted back chair that has five slats and interpolates down to four slats, down to three slats, and finally into a solid back, which is kind of cool. Question in the back. In the, in the middle row, there is this, this tiny effect that in the middle, you have this, yeah, you have this pedestal, but on both sides, you have four legs. So, well, do you know like, what's, what's happening there or why? Can you, uh, sorry, can you speak up just a little bit? I, I, I think I got the gist of your question, but not all of it. So in the middle row, you have this funny effect that you have this pedestal chair. Yeah. Yet on both sides, you have four legs each. Yeah. So this, this is one where it really would have benefited from, uh, from kind of more, uh, I guess, like more time samples, so to speak, in this interpolation. So if I were to play you a video of what this looks like, what actually happens is the chairs, uh, the legs actually kind of shrink into the middle fused to become this pedestal and the pedestal sort of grows out into this big fat armchair base and then the armchair base starts to grow little legs on the end of it. So it actually does make kind of a nice continuous sequence. It's just that, you know, uh, I guess I'll say in, <laughs> in the rush to meet the SIGGRAPH deadline, we didn't quite get the, uh, the optimal uh, sort of freeze frame illustration of that sequence, but that is what's happening. Okay, cool. Um, so Another thing we can do, right, this is a variational autoencoder, so in addition to just sampling from it, we can also do uh, reconstructions. So we can give it um, input, uh, input shapes. These are just, you know, uh, hierarchically organized uh, cuboids. And then we can reconstruct a program from them. Um, so uh, in general, it does pretty well. You'll notice that, like, for some of these things with these kind of very, very rare thin leg features, it doesn't do super well for those. I will show you kind of a cool trick we can use to, uh, to address that problem, though. So in addition to reconstructing um, you know, uh, shapes that are more or less in the same representation as its output space, we could also do the thing of reconstructing you know, very different uh, forms of input. So here we've got our, our pre-trained generative model, and then we, we train a point cloud encoder to take a point cloud and, um, and put that into a point in the latent space such that the decoded, uh, decoded part proxy geometry matches the um, the point cloud as closely as possible. And the cool thing we can do here is, you know, whenever you, whenever you go, you sort of compress the input into a sort of a fixed dimensional latent code, then you decode it, you're going to lose some information. So uh, in, the, in this case, you know, this is not a perfect match for this input, uh, this input point cloud. But what we can do is, remember, the, the, uh, the executor of these programs is differentiable. So we can optimize the parameters of this particular program such that the output geometry it produces matches the input point cloud as closely as possible. And since we know that this program is guaranteed to produce uh, connected geometry by construction, there's no way that doing this optimization can cause anything wonky to happen. Like the parts can't come disconnected or fly apart or anything like that. So it'll sort of say like, under the constraint that the shape ma maintains sort of connected physical plausibility, optimize the geometry so that it's a closer match. And I think this, you know, this definitely looks better than what the uh, original one did. And in fact, this process can sometimes correct some errors in the latent space as well, where this, this part kind of really shouldn't have been there. Um, so that's kind of one of the, I, this is one of my favorite uh, applications from this, uh, from this project, actually. And I think that this suggests maybe other cool things you could do with this combination of generative model and differentiable executor. Uh, so that's just, you know, I've kind of been showing you qualitatively what it does. It's also worth taking a peek at how it relates to some other recent shape generative models. So we compared it to a couple of things. One of them is uh, 3D PRNN, which I think stands for Primitive Recurrent Neural Network. So this is a sequence model that generates a sequence of cuboid boxes, but there's no relations between them. They're just kind of floating in space. The only way in which they're correlated is through the, the sort of hidden state of the RNN. And then we have StructureNet, which is the most immediate predecessor of our paper which uh, you know, it represents shapes by a hierarchy of boxes. They have connections, uh, they have symmetries between them, but there's no kind of explicit mm -hmm. parametric attachment, right? These things are not guaranteed to be connected by construction. Um, so qualitatively, uh, you know, it's the yellow is the, the PRNN, the middle uh, magenta is structure net, and ours is in the blue. Um, 
qualitatively, basically the takeaway is 3D PRNN, um, you know, again, it produces floating parts, things that the other methods wouldn't necessarily do, uh, tends to oversimplify things. Um, one thing I should note is that this method, uh, it generates bilaterally symmetric shapes. So basically it only generates the left side and then just mirrors it across the right, which is kind of, in a way it's kind of cheating, but you know, we, we, we gave it that, we gave it that handicap. Um, StructureNet, I think, tends to produce some things that are sometimes more complex than our shapes, but I think our shapes have a, a different inductive bias that allows them to capture more interesting connections because, again, it's based on connections. Just kind of neat. I'll show you some tables as well. Um, I think uh, there's, just, there's a qualitative difference here. Like the, the StructureNet tables, it tends to have uh, kind of gotten fixated on a sort of a big, chunky part of the state space, um, whereas ours, I think, is a little bit more variety. Um, but you know, your mileage may vary in terms of which one you like better. So of course, we try to quantify this. Um, I, this is a hideously complex table. I, I don't expect you to take everything away from it. I will highlight a few things. Um, the metrics here are the, sort of the number of parts in each generated program or shape. Um, these, three, these three axes or columns are, um, so this one is basically uh, whether the shape is rooted. So whether it's all one connected component of parts and whether that connected component is attached to the ground. And then stable is basically, we, we, we put the thing through a rigid body simulator, we, we poke it and prod it a little bit and we see if it actually stays standing. Uh, and then this one, this percent fool is basically uh, two alternative force choice perceptual study. Uh, how often are people able to tell, distinguish uh, the methods generate results from sort of ground truth, uh, human created models. These have to do with uh, sort of variety and generalization, um, a little bit harder to interpret the results, so I won't focus on them here. But the thing I wanna point out is that uh, across chairs, our method is, is pretty much the best in terms of physical plausibility and visual plausibility. And in terms of tables, we almost, we almost win. Uh, for some reason, structure nets tables are a little bit more stable. I haven't dug into why that is yet, but um, we do pretty well uh, on these two classes. Uh, anybody have any questions they want to ask after staring at these numbers before I move on? Um, I'll give people a chance to, to uh, stare at it for a bit. I don't, want, I don't want it to seem like I'm skipping past this real quick and trying to hide anything from you. <laughs> Not seeing any hands yet. Okay. Okay. So I will just, I'll just go. Oh, was that a hand? Did a hand shoot up there? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I said, why the ground truth shapes are 100% stable? Oh, yeah. Why aren't they, why aren't the ground truth shapes 100% stable? This is a good question. Um, they're pretty close to, uh, it's 90 something percent. I haven't actually taken a peek at which ones are not stable. Um, I think it's the fact that, um, you know, these models, the models are derived from ShapeNet and ShapeNet has geometry from all kinds of sources. Some of which uh, are like actual CAD source models for, for real products like real chairs. And some of them are things that just, you know, random people on the internet made. So there's no requirement that, that these actually be stable. Um, my guess is that's the case. It's possible there's some other artifacts. Um, it'd be, it'd be, it would be worth digging into at some point. We haven't looked at it in great detail. Okay. okay. Let me just deal with that. All right, so um, I got a little bit of time left, so I just want to talk about what's next. Um, there's some low-hanging fruit that we really should take a look at. So for example, uh, you might have noticed that um, sometimes our model can generate things like this because it doesn't actually have symmetry yet as an operator, but we think that this is fairly easily doable. Um, I like to think about, about adding symmetry as kind of like a macro into this language, right? That, that I could have something like a translational symmetry, for example, for this thing here, would be a macro, which would then expand into uh, sort of attachment operators in the base shape assembly language. I think that's kind of a nice um, paradigm for thinking about it. So we really should get those in place. There's some other higher order relations we're thinking about as well. That's kind of ongoing work. Um, there, also are, there also are some shapes that, that this language cannot currently express. Um, so some things like these sort of stubby parts that poke out but, but aren't at exactly right angles. Um, some of these kinds of these like uh, kind of chains that are kind of kinked in the middle. Um, and then some things like I have this, this seat that's attached to two bars on the side and it kind of rotates in a non-axis line way about, uh, about the, um, the sort of vector between those two connections. Um, this is sort of a fundamental limitation of the fact that, that the, on the only way orientation is specified in our language is through attachment points. Um, we do think there is a way to, to make this work if we sort of 
introduce like sort of these ghost attachment points, like uh, you know, a part can sort of attach to a free floating point in space. Uh, we should be able to fix all of these problems by doing that. We just haven't gotten around to it yet, but um, but this is just. I just want to point this out that like we did pay a price by using this the sort of nice representation that guarantees connectivity, which is that we can't actually express every possible shape yet. So we're still working on that. Um, but I, kind of at a broader level, what I wanted to talk about is uh, come back to this diagram of this kind of neuro neurosymbolic design space. Um, and in this talk, I was just focusing on this this little part of the shape structure. And if we think about what else we might want to do. Um, I think it's, it'd be interesting to look at, at sort of, you know, uh, symbolic plus neural representations of the kind of low level geometry of each part. So, you know, uh, if we're talking about uh, a chair back, you know, let's move beyond just the, uh, the sort of bounding box proxy and let's look at the actual surface geometry. I think there is neurosymbolic ways to express that, you know, some, some, some part geometry might be expressed via um, CAD programs, but I might need some sort of uh, neural net to generate some of the like primitive sketches that get used in the in the CAD uh, the CAD program. I might want to have uh, neurosymbolic models of part mobilities. So, what are the what are the kinds of hinges that these things have? How do the parts move with respect to each other? How are those mo motions correlated across the shape? Um, and then uh, moving beyond geometry, looking at surface appearance. You know, I think texture can be expressed as some combination of uh, like a procedural program, especially for things that have regular pattern textures, but there's some sort of detail on top of that that may not be captured by a texture, especially if we're talking about dirt, wear and tear, things like that. Um, and then of course, you know, the, the sort of holy grail here is some joint generative models which couple all of these things together uh, and we can kind of reason about all of them at once. So that's sort of, that's sort of the long-term mission of this line of research. Um, I think with that, I will I'll wrap up. And um, thanks for thanks for having me, even if it's just remotely. And I'm happy to uh, take any questions that people have. Yeah, just feel free to shoot questions at me if you want. So I, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So at the beginning, when you were discussing between like symbolic and like neural models, one of the uh, limitations of the symbolic models is that the output is somewhat constrained, right? And, and I think that you're addressing the, 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 the structure of the output with neural uh, models, but do you have any thoughts on also embedding the neural part to refine the output and go beyond like perfect shapes and just like be able to generate, like basically starting, starting from good geometric shapes, but being able to like deform them with neural models? Yeah, so I think um, I think actually let me let me show you. So here, when I'm talking about um, models of part geometry, I think one of the natural ways to connect these two things is to say, let's generate the shape structure, and then let's have, have um, let's have sort of a, a, as like a second pass. Let's have perhaps a deep generative model take those box proxies and kind of like morph them into the actual final shape geometry. That's like one one direction we're looking at. Um, I think that's that's sort of the lowest hanging fruit. I think that there's also ways, like I was mentioning before, some parts of that geometry could also be expressed symbolically. But I think just throwing the whole thing into a neural net is the is the first way to go. We're not the only people who think about this. There are a few other folks in, in the graphics area around around this field that have been looking at that. They've been looking at like shape structure and then have neural nets try to refine the geometry of those parts. Um, None of them work super well yet, but they're they're getting there, and I think that uh, I don't know, it's an exciting direction to think about. Other questions? No. Okay. Well, I'm happy to wrap up. I know I'm going to chat with some of you uh, some of you later. So yeah, thanks again for uh, for your time. Okay. All right.